Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I'm going to kick this video off discussing Intel's XCSS. And then, of course, we will move over to Intel's older lake disclosures, including price, performance, and some of the specifications. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as home keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. But XESS, for those who missed the early announcements concerning this, is Intel's answer to NVIDIA's DLSS. I think it's important to know that while modern day graphics cards are considerably more powerful than they have ever been, at the end of the day, you are also running so many more visual effects, and modern day game engines, particularly when UE5 becomes prevalent, for example, will be ever more demanding. So if you want to run games at 4K native resolution, 120 hertz, and also hardware-based ray tracing, <laughs> yeah, good luck. And this is why, while, again, technology like hardware-based uh, ray tracing, excuse me, mesh shading and all of these other goodies are really important, there are a number of companies now investing and researching upsampling. NVIDIA have been pioneering a DLSS or deep learning super sampling for a number of years now. And of course it did really kind of come to the forefront when they were pushing the RTX 20 series. Since then, a DLSS has come a long way, but Intel are here now with XESS. In many ways, it's very similar in the fundamental underlying technology, but with a couple of subtle differences. I've discussed XESS a number of times before, so I'll link those videos in the description. But the TLDR here is that it does use a neural network to upsample and does also take things like motion vectors into account. What does this mean? Well, basically it takes past frames of animation and combines them with, well, the current frame that it's working on so it can have a better and more accurate understanding of what's going on with that frame. And then, of course, it can basically upsample. So, for example, from 1440p to 4K and so on and so on. Intel have already commented a couple of times that their roadmap for XESS is actually quite robust. But what is new here is that they have now detailed how this game, how this will actually look in games, excuse me, <laughs> with a small caveat. So the caveat here is that the high quality uploads, for whatever reason, are not available yet. Hopefully this will change pretty quickly. And when it is, I will go over more extensively my thoughts on the quality. But the early looks anyway of what we've seen here, Roger Chandler over at the Intel graphics team have shown off some stuff, looks pretty interesting. So. The important uh, takeaway here is that we've seen the game running on both Hitman 3, we'll get into the specifics in just a moment, as well as a Rift Breaker. Now Rift Breaker, I believe, is already running Fidelity FX Super Resolution from AMD. I think that was sometime uh, this year, like, I don't know, May, June, something along those lines. But when it comes to a Hitman 3, well, you know, looking at these images, and again, we are looking at lower resolution upload, uh, uh, yeah, lower resolution upload, so bit quality, you know, it, it, it does look pretty good. And they're basically scaling from 1080p to 4K. Again, in my personal opinion, looking at these early shots, it does look pretty good. And exactly the same thing could also be said regarding uh, Rift Breaker as well. Now, if you are a developer, Intel have basically opened up testing for the XESS technology. So you can go to the Intel Dev Mesh website. I'll try to remember to link it in the description below. And this basically allows you to mess around with this. Now, to my understanding, it doesn't matter the size of the studio. So for example, if you're an indie developer or someone like Electronic Arts, you're still good to go. And this is going to be very important because Intel are basically really pushing uh, XESS as kind of one of the holy grails of the ARC 
uh, well, ecosystem. Now, naturally, the thing about DLSS is that while quality is really good, especially now that it has been iterated upon so many times, that's the thing with machine learning, neural networks, you know, Skynet, whatever you want to say, the reality is that the more it does a task, the better it gets. So it's going to continue to suck until it starts to actually understand what it's doing, and then it's going to get really good. So, of course, the you know age-old analogy is that if you're trying to get it to understand what a cat image looks like, for example, it's going to be really crap. It's going to be like, is this source been a cat? No. How about this combine harvester? Is that a cat? Sure. Now, the reality, naturally, is that as you start to provide feedback to the neural network so it can understand what is right and what is wrong, it will get more and more and more accurate. So with NVIDIA's DLSS technology, basically when NVIDIA is training it in its supercomputers, it uses an ultra high resolution image. I believe it's like 16K or something like that. And then it basically compares the upsampled results to the 16K ground truth image. And naturally it's starting to get better and better and better. And uh, Intel's technology works very similar, including the aforementioned motion vectors. However, one key difference here is that while DLSS runs on NVIDIA's tensor cores and therefore cannot be run on, say, a Radeon GPU, while on Arc uh, architectures, it can be accelerated using specific instructions, as Intel have already de uh, detailed, if it runs on a competitor GPU or an older Intel GPU, like an XE GPU, it will still run, albeit it will just take longer to, well, basically upsample that frame. However, it's still a speed up. So it's still going to be faster. So as a pure example, if you're running, let's say, a 6800 XT and you are running a game at 4K and it does support Intel's XTSS, it's still going to be faster running XTSS at 4K than trying to run the game natively at, you know, 4K, if that makes any sense. But ultimately, my feelings are pretty good about XESS. I think it's going to really be a big shot in the arm from NVIDIA. I've already mentioned that I've been hearing a lot about DLSS free already. I've had numerous folks tell me that it definitely is real and that it's apparently a big improvement in quality and ray tracing performance is apparently quite a lot faster. We'll see about that one. I'll try to remember to link my exclusive regarding uh, DLSS free in the video description. But either way, I think competition is only ever a good thing. There's not really been anything specific regarding specifications of the GPU, only that Intel have reaffirmed that Arc will basically launch in Q1. However, the caveat here is they've not really confirmed what is gonna launch in Q1. I'm still hearing it might be a mobile first launch, but then again, maybe it won't be. Either way, I'm just really fascinated. I'm super interested in what Intel does with graphics. I think that we need a third player. This is not to say that Nvidia or AMD are doing poorly in the market. <laughs> so as I keep saying to you guys, competition is always a good thing. And next up is Intel's Alder Lake. We've been hearing so much about the 12th generation processors from Intel for a number of months now, including a crap ton of leaks of late. In fact, some retailers have actually been shipping these processors early, which is kind of bizarro land. However, now we actually have official performance numbers, pricing, and a list of SKUs. Now, I will say that while the flagship CPU, the 12900K, looks really impressive, again, we'll get into the specifics in just a moment, I have to say that in my personal opinion, some of the lower end SKUs paired with perhaps a cheaper motherboard could put an awful lot of pressure on AMD's various processor offerings. And it will be absolutely fascinating to see how AMD does respond over the coming months. Now, naturally, one of the things about Intel, it's not just their presence in terms of, well, how good the chip is or bad the chip is. They also have a ton of MDF marketing development funds. And basically, they can run ads all day long. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the market kind of responds to this, how companies like, I don't know, for example, you know, Alienware and whatever start to create uh, PCs based on Alder Lake. But ultimately, the thing is, Alder Lake is a really good product, at least according to what we're seeing here. Let's go over a couple of numbers. I won't go over all of the benchmarks. It is important to realize as well one caveat. So as I'm sure many of you guys who have been uh, messing around with Windows 11 know, Windows 11 wasn't 
the best if you were running a modern Zen processor. Basically, there were a whole lot of penalties regarding the latency in L3 cache, for example. And basically speaking, um, there was a patch which was more recently released which fixes some of those issues. So unfortunately, Intel's testing predated that patch as it is, well, quite new. So the TLDR here is that the comparisons that Intel have made are pre-patch and I will give Intel full credit they did disclose this in well the disclosures section and also Ryan Shrout and others on Twitter have confirmed this as well with this said how much this patch makes a difference really does depend on the game and the application and the other thing too with Intel's testing is that I do suspect that if you started to mess around, and of course the same thing could be said with Zen, if you start to mess around with things like memory timings and all of that stuff, you can usually get a lot more performance. But this is still a general guideline of what you can expect out of Alder Lake. So, gaming performance then. Uh, on Crisis Remastered, which <laughs> is not exactly the best when it comes to utilising a ton of CPU cores slash threads, it's basically well on par i do like the fact that intel have also showed Sh uh, shadow of the tomb raider where it's actually trailing by three percent so credit to them for actually showing a game which it's losing in that is nice uh, i imagine these percentages will change a little bit again if amd um uh had the benefit of the the patch in windows 11 but as for other games well you can see yourself that f1 is around eight percent far cry 6 is around 14 percent mountain blade 16%, Grid, 20%, Troy, a Total War Saga, for some reason or another, heavily benefits. I'm not too familiar with that game, so perhaps someone can tell me in the comments what's going on with the game engine there. I'm very ignorant, I've never played it, so I can't really comment why. I, I forgot to actually do research on that, my bad. Uh, but that's a 30% increase with Intel's processors, so that's actually not too shabby. And the thing is, and um, we'll get more into prices in just a moment, but we're looking at 589 US dollars, which is a little more expensive than what Intel released the 11th generation CPUs at. But I'm sure most of you would agree that while the, you know, there were a couple of 11th generation SKUs that was pretty good, like the 11400 seemed pretty good for the price. Just in general, you know, if you're paying that kind of money, you would have been better to have gone with, let's say, a 5900X, for example, with AMD. Now there does seem to be a lot more fight from Intel. Unfortunately, we don't have a ton of applications to test. So how it's going to run in... Yeah, we, we have technically seen Cinebench leaked, but, you know, just a wider variety of applications like a Premiere, a Photoshop, Blender, you get the point. And it'll be very interesting to see as well when reviewers and tweakers get hold of this thing as well as the general you know audience at large because obviously you know reviewers great but ultimately when we get hold of stuff we only have a certain amount of time to kind of get the review done i suspect when it goes to a wide audience and people can start messing around with things figuring out how things respond to you know uh, under voltage or over voltage figuring out you know the various uh, you know, power stages and stuff like that, uh, power limits, excuse me, <laughs> and just little things like how DDR5 is going to respond to uh, different latencies, because there is a ton of questions at the moment we have regarding these. But bottom line, I suspect that Intel are going to do quite well in gaming. Again, applications is still a mystery. My suspicion is that AMD, just because of sheer, uh, sheer core count in a lot of applications, is probably going to have the advantage. The big question as well, of course, is the Ryzen V caches, which is going to launch next year. So this does, technically speaking, even if Vcache is faster, this does give Intel the fastest processor over the Christmas period, which is obviously a really big, important time with retail. I'm saying the obvious things here. But yeah, it's going to be really interesting to me what happens from, uh, from Intel going forward, especially when Vcache is released and also AMD's pricing strategy. Now, another quite important aspect, actually, of the 12900K is that it actually outperforms by quite a margin the 11900K in terms of power consumption. And obviously, power consumption is quite a big topic. But yeah, you can see Intel's thread here. Um, it basically is running uh, a 250 watts for the 11900K, but plus 50% improvement in multi-thread for 241 watts. So basically the same amount of power, 
albeit 50%. However, if you're running this uh, CPU at 125 watts for normal metrics, then you're looking at 30% increase again versus the 250 watt consumption of the 11900K. Now, I do want to spend just a second going over the prices and specifications of the chip. I won't spend too long on this because, well, everyone at this point knows what the specifications of these processors are. Like, it's been leaked so much online at this point that I'm surprised Intel even bothered to just create a slide. I'm surprised they just didn't go, yep, you guys know what they are. <laughs> it's just the prices instead. So the 12900K has 16 threads, which is thanks to the 8 uh, performance cores and of course there are eight energy efficient cores which do not have hyper threading so that's 24 threads total we're looking at up to 5.2 gigahertz using intel's boost max technology 3.0 i'm just going to call it boost max for the rest of this video so i do not go absolutely insane and the retail pricing here is 589 bucks which in my personal opinion is actually pretty darn good I think that's actually not too shabby. Again, that's my opinion. The 12700K, I'm not gonna read out all the specs here. Meanwhile, is shaving off almost $200, so it's 409. But the chip I suspect is going to be of particular interest to many of you is possibly going to be the 1200, sorry, 12600K or the 12600KF. Now, these retail at 289 or 264 US dollars, respectively. And you can see all of the specifications here, but that is an awful lot of cores to throw at kind of a budget gaming rig. And I suspect that this would be excellent in terms of a pairing with, say, an RTX 3070 or an Arc GPU. Um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. I do kind of suspect, though, that AMD will possibly do a price cut on some of its Ryzen processors. It'll be very interesting to see whether that occurs or not. But yeah, guys, all the like. Intel's back, actually. And I'm really excited because I think, um, you know, the gaming market in, in PCs has been a little bit stagnant. Graphics cards have been reasonably exciting in terms of what's available. Well, <laughs> Okay, let me take that back. Reasonably exciting in terms of what's released, but availability is obviously sucked balls. And in terms of CPUs, it's not really been that exciting because unless you're going to go budget like 12, four, uh, sorry, 11400, you're probably just going to go AMD. Now things are changing quite a bit and I think Intel will have some definite wins. So it's going to be very interesting to me to see how all of this kind of plays out over the next while. One concern I do have is that DDR5 memory is shaping up to be rather expensive, and some of the motherboard prices have already leaked online for the uh, Z690 and... Uh, owie. However, not all of the prices have, and of course you could also go with like a, you know, a B-series board, obviously, if you're going to instead put like a 12600 in, which is definitely a possibility. With that said though, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.